So I have a bit of a problem with kids around my age. I get a bit of an anxiety attack. And the teachers in my school said that I'm just leave, having an excuse to leave school. And it was my mum's fault. And then I was acting like this and all those kind of problems. And the people that I can't say, because I promised someone, also said that. Um, but um, so, um, just to finish this off quickly, um, basically, if you are a kid with special needs or a parent who has a child with special needs, breathe, be together, work together. You only have each other. And, 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 don't, and, don't, and, and, and don't yell at your child and say horrible things. And you kids, I know you can control yourself. So, so breathe and don't, tell your, don't tell, and don't make your mother's life difficult. And try to work together. Try to do something together. Go, go and try, tr I can't say the word properly. I can only say it in Spanish because I'm speaking Spanish for so much. Um, work as a team don't yeah. work as your enemy and don't yeah. listen to the demons inside your head because they're not there to love you they're there to destroy you thank you very exactly. much thank you Jackson. that 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 was one of the most heartfelt accounts um i've ever heard in my life from a young person <laughs> i thought that was fantastic but you know i've always championed you as a public speaker anyway i've always said that you are going to be the voice that people listen to, and that listening to you there, I, I really, it, I don't cry on Zoom. I, don't, I just about go on Zoom, but I really, really felt what you were going through, and it really gave me a great perspective on, on where, or or how somebody with a quote need is handling the world at this moment. So thank you for that. That was that was amazing. That that was amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know I've put times for everybody and I know a lot of you may be saying why 10 minutes because people want more time but the idea of why we're doing this is so that we can have um, create some more um, groups workshops on this to hear the voices of all the speakers I mean there was a lot more speakers but I picked these speakers because they were the ones that came to me quicker and got to, got to me quicker with a response um, the next person well actually let me just say something quickly about um, Jasmine Jasmine has been one of the She's been around me for, I would say, for like four or five years. And all the time when I've been somewhere, it was Jasmine that used to come to me and say, she feels that my voice should be heard and I, sh I hide too much behind the camera. So way back, I think in, I think when I did the first ever Lamb of Autism show, she came and helped him from the beginning to the end. And then she, she put me on camera and she said she felt that my, I was not vocal enough and it was through Jasmine I think gave me the encourage as well to come forward so thank you Jasmine and thank you for always volunteering for me you and your mum because people don't realise a second voice hasn't just been just me on my own there's lots of other autistic people and the mothers and fathers and autistic people are always there to support me so thank you again Jasmine for being very open just to let you know we didn't record it, it didn't go on to Facebook live so in a way I think it sort of protected you as well so people, does, that, does everybody agree? Yeah, I think yeah. for your part, I don't think it should go out publicly. For those who have listened to it right now, they can see that it, it needed to be said. Okay, what we're going to do quickly, I think, mm -hmm. should we just go ahead with all the everybody speaking? And what we do is we can look at all the the chats that are coming through. And maybe we can go through that after, just to make sure that everybody gets their voice through. Yeah, Hello, Nicole. Yeah, I'm writing them all down so okay. we can go on. So we've got Melissa next. Okay, so with Melissa, I I don't know how I end up finding Melissa, but I think I was Google searching crazy as I do on Twitter. And I came across her and I found her on Facebook, but it took her a while, just like Jackie, a very long time. So when somebody says the person's taken long to respond, I found it in the end sometimes with autistic people. If they don't know you, why should they open up to you? So... In the yeah. end, it took about a year, I think, between Jackie and Melissa to respond to me. Even though I know Jackie from 2013, Melissa, last year I attended one of her events and I was blown away. Um, you can find her, her YouTube um, dissertation, what she did at, is it University of Sheffield? So as I said, I'd like to introduce Melissa, who can just tell you a little bit about being autistic as a black scholar. 
Um, yeah, I have to thank you as well, actually, because you came all the way from London to come and hear me talk. And I really appreciated that because um, I can honestly say this is the first time I've met so many black autistic <laughs> adults, um, which is strange. It, it should be normal. It should be absolutely normal if you think about the percentage of the population that's autistic. I should run into autistic people quite often and I don't. Uh, so my son was diagnosed um, with autism in 2010 and I really thought it was the end of the world. I really truly did because the first thing I did is I googled it and it was really really negative and I, I just thought his life was over and started to attend a group called ACT, which is Asperger's Children and Carers Together in Sheffield, and started to learn about my son and be amongst other families who had autistic children. I then started to realise that actually, when girls are autistic, it can manifest differently. So lots of girls mask their autism. So um, they tend to just be, not all, but tend to be better at pretending that everything's okay. Um, and so because of that, it's harder for to learn to get diagnosed. And while I was there, I realized that my daughter was autistic. So she was diagnosed in 2014. Um, but going to all those meetings, I actually realized I was autistic as well, which I found really, I wasn't sure what I felt about it. But one of the things I did know is that I've always felt incredibly different and couldn't figure out why. So even amongst my family, I felt like I didn't fit in. So I could be in the room with all my family and I felt really lonely. We had absolutely nothing in common. The, the, the way they looked at life, their aspirations, just their way of explaining things, just felt really, really foreign to me. And so I always, on both sides of my family, just felt odd. I felt like I didn't fit in but carried on with my life like you do. And so being amongst those other adults that were autistic, because they'd, they'd all got diagnoses after their children did, I started to realize that actually, you know, there's a big community of people who get late diagnosis. So um, I just wanted to understand autism more so that I could be the best advocate I could for my children. And so started on my journey in studying about it. And so I'm in my final year of a master's degree in autism studies. But the day, the first day when I walked in the room, I was really disappointed because I was the only black person in there. And all my life, um, I've been the only black person in the room. So I grew up in Sheffield, but for a short time, I moved to London. And when I was in London, um, I did have more black girls in my class because I went to a girls school but in Sheffield uh, school college university I tend to be the only black person in my class and so I really wanted to learn from other people but again I was the one who felt like I had to be getting all the knowledge to teach others um my first ever uh assignment I was looking at the late diagnosis in black children and thought I would be able to find research on black autistics in the UK and there's absolutely nothing. So a lot of the studying that I did, I had to be getting information from America and I had to be looking in different areas of academia. So, you know, education, uh, psychology, sociology, I had to be getting other things to bring it in. So um, learning about how black people are disproportionately um, misdiagnosed or learning that a lot of individuals who are in prison actually are autistic, but they never received a diagnosis and they've struggled through life. So I was getting, I was getting information which was actually making me feel even more depressed because I felt like I felt like I was doing this all on my own. But I've done things by myself before and so I carry on because I'm a mum and it's weird because 
what I found in the autism community is I found a lot of unity because it's a community of people who have always felt alone and like they didn't fit in. And so they've now found this wonderful community. But what I find for black autistics is the, um, the white autistics tend to not realize that autism doesn't define us because the first thing you see when you see me is you see my skin color. So I am, before I'm autistic, I'm black, but also I've always been autistic. So you've got that intersectionality with me of disability, race, also being a woman, all of those things tie in and it actually makes my journey more difficult. And I think some people within the community really struggle with that. They struggle to acknowledge and accept that my journey is harder because they think, well, we're all in this together. Um, my kids are amazing individuals. They're so happy and they're so healthy and I'm so thankful for that. So my house is always full of laughter, constantly full of laughter, full of love. Um, my children are full of empathy. They're kind and they're loving, you know, they can be pains in the arse as like any other child can. And so for me, I feel like I'm in a really fortunate position with that. But then COVID came and actually, COVID just screwed everything up. You know, it's a pandemic and a pandemic means it's going to affect everybody. So all of a sudden, you know, I started washing my hands uncontrollably all the time. And um, thankfully, one of the, for me, one of the benefits of being in lockdown meant I wasn't having to wash my hands as much because I wasn't amongst lots of people because as black people, you know, being ashy is real. We don't want to be ashy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't want to be ashy, Paul, right? <laughs> and as a black person, constantly washing my hands, my hands were just, they've aged so much. Yeah. And so being locked down really helped me a lot. It really helped me in that regard. I've got two very different children. Um, I've got a son who is loving isolation. He's loving just chilling in his room and doing his, he's doing his studying in his room and he's really happy with it. And then I've got a boisterous daughter who loves interacting with people, even though she really struggles with it. So she wants to be out and about and doing things. And I've somehow as a mom got to contain, soothe, nurture and support two children who are really scared because they don't understand what's going on. I've got to try and meet both of their needs, but also I've got to try and acknowledge that I'm really struggling as well. And because I've masked all my life, because I got to like 34, 35 before I even got a diagnosis of autism. So I, because I've masked, I don't really know how I'm coping. You know, there are, I'm up and down, but most of the time I contain it because first and foremost, I'm a mum. And I feel like it's my job as a mom not to collapse, not to break, yeah. to make them feel safe. But it means that I'm really struggling. So for me, when I'm overwhelmed with life, I hurt myself by overeating. And so um, I have to be really, really um, careful. I have to be really mindful with what foods I'm buying because I can eat large volumes of food which is no good for anybody's health and so I attend something called Overeaters Anonymous which is a lot like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous and um, Overeaters Anonymous supports people who eat compulsively who overeat compulsively and so for me being in a pandemic and trying to contain these two children plus my own anxieties has been a real struggle. But, you know, I always kind of, you know, I think I, when I make an effort, I look pretty decent, you know, do make sure my hair looks all right, make sure I'm not ashy, smile and laugh and joke with people. But inside I'm this frightened little girl yeah. who's cowering in the corner, you know, and because I don't want to explode, because I don't want to have meltdowns, like we, we see people have meltdowns, because I 
because I can control my meltdowns, which isn't always a good thing, I will wait until people aren't around and then I'll compulsively overeat. And that's how I'm coping with, um, with this. And it, it's horrible because I know I shouldn't be eating the, the food item. I know it's not good for me. I know that the next day I'm going to wake up and feel hungover because that really does happen to me. I wake up and it feels like someone's been stomping on my head. Um, so I know it's not good for me, but it's the only way that I can cope. Um, I know my, my, my time's up and I, I could always talk for England, but I do, I have that inner belief that I will get through this because I have no other options because I have to, I have to be positive and optimistic because I'm a mother. Thank you. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to really ask you what you found your biggest challenge to be in a lockdown, because you strike me as a very powerful woman outside in the real world, as well as being that loving and nurturing mum in the home. So being in that lockdown situation where you can't, I mean, we all have the internet, but there's only so much you can do with that, you know, reaching out from your desktop. Um, what, what's your biggest challenge? Uh, I know you said about the overheating, but is, is that your biggest challenge? Or, or is there another challenge? I'm, I mean, with this whole lockdown. I'm really, do you know what I've struggled with the most? I struggled mm. when the government changed the rules about autistic people being able to go out more than once. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And the reason yeah. I struggled with that is because I knew that it meant that why autistics were never going to, they weren't going to, they were then going to be able to go out more. But I knew that as black people, we are stopped and searched and questioned. Okay. That's when we're right. out and about more, right? Yeah. And I'm a person who, the way my brain works, I, I, I listen to LBC every day because I don't understand I don't understand Brexiteers. So I will listen to things to try and understand their mm. thinking. And I heard so many people phoning in angry that the police had asked them what they're doing and where they're going. And I thought to myself, that's what black people experience all the time. Um, yeah. And I, I, really, I really struggled with it because I was scared that people would then abuse it uh, going out more often. So it was the injustice of the rules that was set, that were put in place yeah. during this pandemic. I've really struggled with the injustices of all the rules more than anything else. Um, and then the Black Lives Matter thing, I, I found that really, really hard. I've found it hard, people not understanding that, you know, people had to go out and protest. I found that hard that people the pandemic is awful and it's affecting everybody and it's disproportionately affecting black and brown people. Mm. And my mum's my best friend and I've not seen my mum now in 11 weeks because uh, she's yeah, an NHS that's... worker. Yeah. But I would still be willing to not see my mum for another 11 weeks um, for people to go out and protest because it is that important to me as a mum to a black son who acts his, his mannerisms aren't always typical. And I fear for my son's future. I really do, as, as an autistic black boy, I fear for his future. And so people need to understand that his life is important and that he shouldn't be seen as different. And so for me, um, I, I, will, I will stay at home as long as I need to for people to go out and protest. I fully support the protests. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was, that again, another amazing testimony there. Um, stay strong. You are. You know, you're strong and powerful. The world is a really changing place at the moment. So much has happened in the last three months. It's so difficult to keep up with it. You just kind of help wondering what tomorrow is going to be like. Yeah. Um, but I know they're flagging me. We're out of time. So thank you very much for that. Thank um, you. I'm sure you're going to bring on the next speaker now. Thank you. Um, thank you.
sorry, Kofi's not here. Maybe, as I said, there's been problems with logging in for some reason. We've got Don Biswas here, who's a comedian, and he was um, introduced to me by the National Water Society when we was doing the Lambeth Autism Group, um, AGM. So Don has said that, um, yes, that everybody's got to mute themselves while he's, he's um, doing his piece. So he's a comedian. And there you go. It's all to you, Don. One minute. I'm going to ask you to mute. Hello there. Is everyone uh, unmuted? Oh, you want us all unmuted yeah. or muted? Yeah. If that'd be great. Cheers. Thanks for that. Unmute. There you go. Like an audience, right? Yeah, pretty much. Cheers for that. I like that. I like that. Oh, everybody on? Yeah, I like that. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I will uh, attempt to do some stand-up comedy. Uh, my name is Don. A big thank you to Vanessa. Uh, before I go about autism, I want to explain myself. I'm from South London. Uh, I'm from Wimbledon, which is the home of tennis. Uh, also true about me is I have a learning difficulty called dyspraxia, which, among other things, affects my coordination skills. Therefore, I am terrible at sport. So as you can imagine, growing up in Wimbledon, <laughs> and having coordination difficulties do you know what that made me British number three <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, stand up comedy isn't my only hobby before the lockdown I like to try out a different and new social activity every week just before the lockdown I took my friends to a escape room Basically, I invited them to my overbearing Indian mother's house. <laughs> Trust me, I've been trying to leave for 37 <laughs> years. <laughs> sure. That's how long it's been. I'm also a political comedian. A uh, political comedian I'm on the left of the politics. Uh, I voted for Jeremy Corbyn in the last elections. I think he should have been prime minister, not Dominic Cummings. <laughs> um, boom. It's so true. Uh, why am I left wing? Because I'm anti austerity. Austerity has affected me. As a brown man living in South London, I now have to stop and search myself. <laughs> so please uh, cut that. Nah, <laughs> the messy way. <laughs> I should explain myself. I'm also slightly autistic. Genuinely true story. Several years ago, diagnosed with a mild form of Asperger's syndrome, slightly autistic. It's a form of autism where you have problems communicating. Basically, you can't read someone else's body language. Now, I don't necessarily think I've got this Asperger's. I wouldn't be here today looking people in the eye trying to tell jokes. And anyway, one of the symptoms of Asperger's the doctor said I had, no word of a lie, was having one-sided conversations with other people. You guess that that's not Asperger's, what the doctors just described there as a stand-up comedian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm starting to think what, ha what happened several years ago when I got tested, my results got mixed up with someone who is genuinely autistic. And now what's happened, I tell you what's happened, there's some kind of Rain Man-like figure out there on the circuit who's been told by a doctor he's a chameleon. <laughs> <laughs> it is true, I am autistic. I am slightly autistic. Uh, I've got mild traits of Asperger's syndrome. So I'm not Rain Man, I'm more Drizzle Boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. That's good. Joe. That is good, Paul, but it sounds like the Drizzle worst boy. record ever, doesn't it? That's a great, that's a great name, Drizzle Boy. I like Drizzle that. Boy, I might call that for my autobiography. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> hey, for those non-autistic people out there, what is it like having Asperger's? It's like going to Los Angeles. Go to Los Angeles, and that's where it likes to have Asperger's. Go to Los Angeles, the home of Botox, where no one can read facial expressions. <laughs> Outright. I'm going to move on to a... Do you want to hear a ha do you want to hear a happier subject about my life? Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about my depression. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know Britain is the sixth richest economy in the world, and yet we don't invest enough in talking therapies? Currently, there's a huge waiting list for free counselling on our National Health Service. On the side note, I'm not even a comedian, I'm not. I'm just a depressed person who's realised it's quicker to talk to someone by becoming a stand-up rather than waiting for free counselling on the National Health Service. <laughs> Very good.
I want to talk right. about an issue that's close to me. And by the way, this is a lovely gig to do because I haven't gigged in a few months. I haven't done an actual physical gig in a few months. The only way as a comedian I can get a round of applause now is if I leave my house dressed as, as a paramedic. <laughs> This guy's hardcore, he's hardcore. But the only way I can get heckled is if I dress up as a statue. But I'm not going to do that. I want to talk about the Black Lives Matter. Black people won't say other lives don't matter. That was the mainstream media. You can talk about the issue that's still going to affect you. Black people can talk about Black Lives Matter. Uh, Women can talk about feminism. I'm going to talk about the issue that affects me. This fraxy awareness. Which is weird because we have none. Uh, so where do I stand politically? I'm anti-austerity. I want to talk about nothing about the Black Lives Matter movement. I've got a lot of black and Asian friends of mine who have been harassed, chased, and followed by the police. That is never going to happen to me. I am never going to be followed by the police because I've got Asperger's and dyspraxia, which affects my coordination, social, and organisation skills. The police will never follow me because not even I know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I am anti austerity. Austerity is affected me. Did you know uh, the latest bailout deal imposed by the EU, EU onto Greece means more austerity for the Greek people, even though in the past it's reduced that economy by 25%? But wasn't it Einstein who said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results? No, no one's laughing. But wasn't it Einstein who said the definition of insanity <laughs> and expecting different results? Very good. Very good. Very good. Wasn't it Einstein who said the definition of insanity? <laughs> no, I'll leave with a few more things. Where do I stand politically? I am also a conspiracy theorist. And what is it like to be a conspiracy theorist? It means that people have been socially distancing from me even before the pandemic started. And I'm only talking about a certain conspiracy theory, people often call you a nut job without ever doing the research themselves. Surely that's very close-minded. We do research in every other walk of life. For example, I do research into my skill set to see if that matches the job I'm applying for. And then I realise this, I have learning difficulties, I have no skill set. I often wonder, what would the perfect job be for me? And then I realise this, I have problems with spatial awareness. You know, judging different distances, different heights, lengths and widths. Therefore, I could get a job as a state agent. <laughs> I want to talk about a few other things. I want to leave you with a few one-liners because I started out as a one-liner merch. I want to talk about the Nazis. Do you think if Hitler was alive today that he could challenge Churchill to cheaper car insurance? Very good. <laughs> no, 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 no. My traditional Indian parents were absolutely living when I told them I batted for the team, if you know what I mean. Pakistan. <laughs> it's amazing to think after a few years in comedy, I got reviewed as one to watch for the future. Unfortunately, that review came from the Criminal Records Bureau. <laughs> and I'll leave with this. I want to tell you about the type of world I want to live in. I want to live in a world where black and Asian people don't get excluded and black and Asian history is taught. The fact that Winston Churchill was responsible for the famine of four million Bengalis where my parents are from. I want to live in a world where we don't have austerity. We have paedophile MPs in power who are, God knows what they're doing to kids in camps. I want to live in a world where everyone is accountable and there's no austerity and the bankers are getting away with all and yet we're playing black, Asian and people of benefits and immigrants. By the way, all this has been said before, and I leave with this, all this has been said before, it's been said before. I'm just saying it again and hope that this time people will listen and do something about it. After all, wasn't it Einstein who said the definition of insanity? <laughs> <laughs> I've been rough and ready, I've been done busy, I'm looking forward to the rest of the speakers, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Can I can I just can I just cut in there real quick, um, just to tell you how talented you are because a, a lot of people don't know this, but in my late twenties I was actually a stand up comic, uh, oh, and I was a stand up I was a stand up comedian for ten years, and and I understand the challenges that I had 
just interacting and, and getting on with that stand-up comedy as a normal comedian. So for you, having you, I've been watch you d deliver that set there. I can only take take my hat off to you. Thanks very, very much. Good. I really appreciate that. Very very good. Thank you guys. Can everybody put themselves on mute? Oh. <laughs> um, Kofi just came in. Laurie, are you okay for Kofi to take your spot? Nice yes, 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 I am. Is everybody okay with um, a 10 minute delay now? Because obviously, is everybody's okay? Everybody's all right? Yeah. Kofi, you there? I'm here, I'm here. Um, um, sorry for coming in late. Um, I, have trouble, I have trouble with Zoom because um, this app is so complicated. <laughs> so yeah, um, just to introduce myself, um, I'm Kofi. I'm a young poet, young artist from Manchester. Um, I have, um, I, I'm like young autistic artist from Manchester, and um, I thought I'd like to talk today about like my um experiences um with um like intersectionality in regards to like intersectional discrimination in regards to um both autism and um race and um like. Most of it actually came from um, came from school because when I was at school, um, well, secondary school anyway, I went to a school um, called the Barlow RC High School, um, which is in a predominantly um, very middle class and white area of Manchester called Didsbury. And um, the reason why I was sent there, well, my parents um, sent me there, is because they felt that it had more um it was more it was very it was more well it specialized more with um, p um children younger people with young well children with special educational needs and um when i was like at the time when i was at school this doesn't really happen anymore but um schools got funding for taking in um um young people you know, children with special educational needs but um like I've um according well according to my parents and I could say this myself um due to my experiences there as well um I've I was pretty much neglected and basically I was I was basically just a cash cow basically um so I was pretty much neglected from I was pretty much neglected from the start um year seven fit my first year of high school. Like, there was no, there was no real support. Yes, I had um, a TA next to me in every lesson and so forth, but that was really just about it. And like the TAs, they were very, most of them were very half assed Um, like you could see that they were not trained or like they did not have the skills. Um, I didn't really benefit from a lot of my classes, like as an excuse to like because they because my school saw me as dead weight. I was put in um, set four, um, well, bottom set for it, bottom set for every, uh, um, literally everything um, at school, and I was often, well, I was often bullied a lot. N again, nothing done, and like that was the intersectionality between my race and um, um, my um, um, Asperger's as well. Um, I often, like, I often got very um, racial and very um, uh, ableist abuse um, from 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 the other pupils, and there wasn't really a lot of education um, in regards to disability, well, or race either. Like, of course, no no school teaches you about the British Empire, well, in its entirety, should we say, um, the truth the full truth but yeah um i remember in year nine up until year 11 um i was um put in these um these classes called key skills and like what i found was like literally everyone in these uh, everyone in these classes were um special educational needs um children um, whether it be kids from other countries learning the English language or um, dyslexic or, or autism um, along to um, um, other neuro, neurodiverse um, 
neurodivergent ch um, children, basically. And basically, um, we had to do it. We didn't really have the option to do our languages, um, do languages in year nine, year 10, year 11. So we had to do key skills instead. And in key skills, it was very degrading because we were basically doing stuff that we did in primary school, basically doing ABCs and um, figure basically like doing like one at one, like, num like numbers. It just felt like year one again, spell your name and so forth. Like, are you able to spell your name? And it's like, yeah, it's just things like that. So um, rather than give me the, thinking the tools that I actually needed at that point in my life, I was taken away. Uh, basically, I was basically cast aside. I was just seen as dead weight. I was just a cash cow. And um, um, I basically was just left to rot basically of course i thrived um after leaving school of course well, i've had i've had my share fair share of discrimination after that but most of my discrimination as being black and being as a black autistic uh, came in school so yeah um that's all i have to say if anyone has any questions thank you i know i know we want to keep the time